welcome to Just Say No, effectively prioritizing content requests and keeping your sanity. I am Christy Guzik. Professionally, I'm a staff UX content strategist. As an accessibility introduction, I'm a short white woman with green eyes and somewhere between wavy and curly brown hair that's around shoulder length. I'm currently wearing a red blouse with some fluttery sleeves. So let's talk saying no. In college, my roommate and I had this pink post-it note with the word SAY NO written in all caps in big, bold Sharpie. We'd keep it attached to our computer monitors where it was visible. We'd pass that post-it note back and forth to whichever of us had agreed to take on something we really shouldn't have and it was stressing us out. Or we'd hand it off when the other person had been asked to do something and was considering whether or not to do it. What, whatever that project happened to be. I don't know where that pink post-it note ended up be going, but there are times when I think to myself, I need that post-it note back. In fact, I'm so bad at saying no that I took one of those random BuzzFeed quizzes a year or so ago, and I feel personally attacked by my results. You're bad at saying no. You love helping others, but often forget to put yourself first and end up over committing and tiring yourself out. It really is okay to say no every now and then. Gee, thanks, BuzzFeed. Tell me something I don't know. As I was preparing for this presentation, I actually went and tracked down that quiz, retook it, got the same results, and pulled the link to share in case anyone else is interested in taking it. Who here has heard the quote, no is a complete sentence? It seems like I've heard this quote more times than I can count. In fact, I don't even know who to attribute that quote to. I've heard it so many times but who is comfortable actually saying no? I mean, besides toddlers, because toddlers rock at saying no. A normal conversation with my three-year-old niece, Morgan, goes something like, Morgan, smile, no. I mean, she's so good at saying no that she does it even when she doesn't have a choice but to do the thing you're asking her to do. Morgan, time to get out of the pool and dry off. We have to go soon. No. Or the ever popular, it's time to get ready for bed. No. Yes, let's go brush our teeth. No. You really need to brush your teeth. No. We are so focused on showing our value and fighting for a seat at the table that we turn into chronic yes people, whether or not we want to be. We fight for that seat at the table. And once we maybe kind of sort of get it, we worry that saying no will hurt those relationships we fought so long to build. So it becomes, can you put a sentence in this placeholder text box? Yes. Will you write a short customer email about that outage? Yes. I need a quick error message for this scenario. Code freezes in 20 minutes. Yes. We need to update the documentation for tomorrow's release. Yes. I was one of these chronic yes people. We've already established that I'm not really good at saying no. In fact, you might say I'm particularly bad at it. So why am I here talking to you all about saying no? Well, let me tell you a story. A few years ago, I owned a content migration project. This was a major undertaking because we released monthly. So we needed almost constant access to our source files. We did a test migration and everything worked fine. So we were as confident as we could be that the migration would go well. Well, of course, the migration did not go so smoothly when we actually did it, and we ran into pr some problems. This started a back and forth with the vendor over the next two weeks. From start to finish, I worked 18 days on this migration. I worked nights. I worked weekends. After those 18 days, I asked my manager for some compensatory or comp time. His reply was, well, why did you work that much? That was the moment I said, never again. And I went on a mission to rearrange my professional priorities and boundaries to not put myself in that position again. In the fall, it felt like everywhere you turned, there was yet another article about how workers were quiet quitting. I came across this quote on LinkedIn. It's only quiet quitting if it comes from the Champagne region of France. Otherwise, it's just sparkling boundaries, right? We're setting boundaries. To me, it seems like people were getting frustrated with constantly being asked to do more and more and more and not really seeing a benefit from it. In fact, setting boundaries is so important that an American Society of Landscape Architects study in 2006 focused on the difference a fence makes when studying preschool children's play. When the children were at a playground without a fence and told to play as normal, they tended to stay close to their teacher. However, when the playground was surrounded by a fence, the children ran and explored within the given boundary. 
in conclusion, the overwhelming conclusion was that with a given limitation, children felt safer to explore a playground. Without offense, the children were not able to see a given boundary or limit and thus were more reluctant to leave the caregiver. With a boundary, in this case the fence, the children felt at ease to explore the space. They were able to separate from the caregiver and continue to develop in their sense of self while still recognizing that they were in a safe environment within the limits of the fence. So let's build our fences. If we don't create our fences, other people will for us. So what should our fences look like? And since we're a group of leaders, it's on us to set good standards and model them. Others follow our leads. So if you don't want others sending Slack messages after hours, you shouldn't either. That delay send feature until the other person's work hours is your friend. And email and Teams have similar features as well. Ideally, your entire team is going to work together to set team boundaries that cover things like lead time for requests, the exact services you do and don't do, and response times for requests that come into your queue. The book Liftoff Practical Design Leadership to Elevate Your Team, Your Organization, and You by Chris Avore and Russ Unger has an entire chapter on this topic, including a guide used by the experienced design team at 18F that I encourage you to take a look at. If your team has such guidelines, great, congratulations. If not, I found that most teams end up having unofficial boundaries, even if they are discussed and clearly defined. And sometimes that boundary is there are no boundaries. Now, this is not a talk about setting boundaries, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention a few things to consider when you are setting your personal boundaries. For instance, after hours and off hours availability, will you respond to email and Slack messages in the evenings and on weekends? What about holiday availability? If holiday or weekend coverage is needed, say for instance, that week of Thanksgiving where Black Friday is a big deal for your retail customers, if coverage is needed, is there a schedule, a rotation? Everyone's just ex expected to be available at all times? Another thought on paid time off. Can someone, I'm not saying everyone, but somebody reach you while you're on PTO or are you completely off the grid? Does your company offer unlimited PTO? If so, are there standards around what's acceptable to take or does it end up that no one ends up taking PTO? Or if your company has a set number of days in a calendar year and you lose them at the end of the year, are you adjusting your calendar and setting your, your calendars in such a way that you aren't losing time at the end of the year and you're making sure that you have enough time to rest and recharge? What about no meeting days? Does your team have them? If so, do you block it off and decline meetings that's scheduled for those days? Or if you don't have one, can you start one? Another thought is work hours. Does your calendar show your start and end time each day? Super critical when you work with people in multiple time zones like I do. Is a 10 a.m. Eastern time, 7 a.m. Pacific time meeting okay with someone in Seattle? How are you gonna know unless work hours are set on your calendar? And finally, lunchtime. Many people take the, if it's not booked, it's available stance. So do you block off your lunch hour? Plus, with so many people working in multiple time zones, it's hard to keep track of who might be in the noon hour and who isn't. Okay, so we've covered some areas of personal boundaries around work hours, availability, and the like, but let's talk about the biggie, workload. What about workload? Some of you might be a team of one, and others are part of a large content organization. So in some aspects, one size doesn't fit all. In a team of one, if you don't do the work, it's likely not getting done. In a team of 10, if you don't do the work, it might not get done, but it also might get picked up by somebody else. In either case, a lot of times we're the only content person supporting a lot of different people and different projects, and it can feel like you're juggling all the balls in the air and more keep being added. This is actually where my content migration story returns. I realized when my manager said, well, why did you work so much? That I was hiding a problem, and by just doing the work, I was stressing myself out, I was working crazy hours, but yet all the work was happening so no one realized that there was a problem or that more content people were needed because I was being a band-aid. And all that work was happening so the band-aid was fine for, from management's perspective. 
Likewise, if I'm providing ad hoc content services of just give me one sentence for this screen or an error for that scenario, I was demonstrating that my value was fully realized with quick blocks of work. And all I was good for was providing copy and completed prototypes rather than being part of the overall design process when thinking through the designing of that content experience. But because it was stretched so thin, that ended up being most of what I was providing for the teams that I worked with. And as I'm sure you noticed by now, I'm not an expert in this subject. Strategy is not the things you do, it's the things you choose not to do. Chances are you've heard this quote, um, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do by Michael Porter from any number of successful executives. When they say they say no of upwards of 90% of the things that they're presented with, allowing them to focus on those few items that most align with their interests and strengths. So using that as an inspiration, we need to figure out what's the highest priority work items so that we know what not to do and what to say no to. The highest priority items might be the ones with the most complicated design. They might be where you can grow in an area of professional interest, or they might be an area where customers are confused and you're working to bring in clarity. So identify your project breakdowns by percentage and then scale up or down accordingly. For this, you really wanna work with organizational leaders, whether that be your manager, management from other organizations in the company, or a group of people, whether that be product man management leaders or, or someone else, to really identify what the highest priority items that have a customer impact are. Because you don't wanna be including things that don't have a customer impact in the work that you're doing. So say there are three high priority projects right now. One of them might be a backend database update. Another one might be a new sign-in experience for a cloud platform. And the third might be a new business to business product launch. Should you be spending a third of your time on each of these, 50% on two of them and no time on the third or some combination, some other combination where you might then also have time for office hours or some ad hoc requests that come in and are high priority. This is why it's important to have an agreement from across the organization on where you and your team should be focusing. So for example, that backend database update might be internal only, so you don't need to spend any time on there. The new sign-in experience, well, there's some complications, there's some error scenarios that you need to look at, so you're gonna spend 25% on that. And that new business-to-business -business product launch, well, there's four sprint teams working on it, it's a complicated workflow, so that's gonna be 50% of your time. And then that leaves 25% for office hours or working on content standards or whatever else is deemed high priority. So now comes the tricky part, the saying no to stuff part. That work friend who slacks you asking for some help, the people who used to rely on office hours for help as they don't have dedicated support, or the people who think it's great that you're working on high priority items until it impacts them. In an October 2022 study by Lou et al. published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied, they found people often find it difficult to refuse requests from others partially because they are concerned about the negative consequences they will face from saying no. The results from seven studies and four supplementary studies showed that rejectors overestimated these negative consequences. This overestimation persisted in hypothetical real life and incentivized settings, or as Adam Grant says, saying no is not as costly as you expect. Declining doesn't mean you don't care, it means you're taking care not to overextend yourself. I received a piece of advice on this topic that I'm sharing with you. Create a say no statement, practice it, and make it part of your life. One of the reasons I think we all say yes so much, even if we know we can't commit to the work, is because saying no is awkward and uncomfortable and we don't wanna alienate anyone. So if you thoughtfully consider how you wanna turn someone down and practice it until it becomes natural, you might still feel awkward and uncomfortable when telling others, but it shouldn't come across that way. And if you feel comfortable with your message, over time it will become easier and easier and you'll start to feel more comfortable with it. So let's talk about constructing your say no statement. Some things you wanna consider. What are you wanna say? How direct you wanna be? And what alternative are you offering? So let's take a look at a few examples. You could be straight into the point and say something like, that sounds like a project I'd love to get involved with, but it's not currently part of my priorities. 
I'll send you a link to our content standards to help you in my absence. With pushback, you could add something like, if you think that project is higher priority for me to work on, we'll need to bring an X to consider that request along with my other workload. An X could be your manager, a product manager, some leader in the business who would need to weigh in on the conversation. If you think the project sounds like one that you should be working on and should be part of your priorities list, your statement may be, let me talk to X and see if we can accommodate that project. Or maybe you simply state all the time, I can't commit to new work without talking to X and seeing where it fits in my priorities list. Let me talk to X and circle back to you if I can join that project. In the book, The Power of a Positive No, Save the Deal, Save the Relationship, and Still Say No, William Uri states, saying no means first of all saying yes to yourself and protecting what is important to you. In the work world, we can take that to mean protecting your time to focus on those high priority tasks and not losing your sanity trying to do too much. He suggests a yes, no, yes framing. The first yes expresses your interest. It's internally focused. The no asserts your power. And the second yes furthers your relationship. This yes is externally focused. So for an example, using this framing, you could say, I'm currently working on X and I'm loving tackling it. While it sounds like quite the interesting project, I won't be able to take on that additional work. I put together some content standards that the team can reference in my absence that I'll send to you. As you use the standards, use the feedback form to send your thoughts and questions so that I can improve them. So in summary, we have talked about setting your personal boundaries identified your business goals and where you should focus your time given those priorities, and most importantly, how to actually say no. Now comes hopefully the good part of all this, arguing for more headcount. When you stretch yourself too thin, it doesn't show your value to people you bring. You might become nothing more than a glorified copywriter. And as you know, anyone can write. So while you might be doing that bright, shiny copy, Edit, it perpetuates the stereotype of content design as something that doesn't require specialized skills. So when you start being strategic and focusing on those high value, high impact priorities, maybe it's the team that doesn't want your involvement that gets set aside, but you can start a comparative analysis between the projects that you work on and the projects that you don't. This is when data becomes particularly useful. So for example, does your support team keep analytics around where support cases come in? Are the areas that you're working on showing a lower likelihood of support cases compared to those that you aren't? Is the impact 10% more support cases for the areas you aren't working on, maybe 50% more? That's a great data point to have if you can point to it. Another thought, drop off rates during in product workflows. Do you have analytics that tracks drop off rates by page throughout a workflow experience in your product? If so, are there a higher completion percentage for the workflows that you're working on compared to those that you aren't? What's the difference between them? That could be a great data point to point to for the argument that you need more content people on your team. Or they're always popular before and after screenshots, showing these two different groups with callouts, identifying the problems in the ones that you didn't work on. Maybe it doesn't meet brand standards, maybe there are legal issues with it, but you can show Here's a one that I did not work on. Here's some issues with it. Here's one I worked on and how those issues were resolved. So when you take this data, hopefully you can make the case to hire another content person and another and another until you have a full team, if you don't already. But even if you have a full team, I'm sure you still need more people. And while you might still have to be strategic about what you're focusing on, your entire team will be able to be more focused on that strategic work without feeling that you all are stretched too thin and not doing too much besides replacing lorem ipsum in the wireframes. So with that, I want to thank you for your time today. I hope I provided some helpful tips on how best to say no. Thank you.